but for any eve of the 4th of July. I, Paul Harvey, do herewith bequeath unto you something to remember. You may not be able to quote one line from the Declaration of Independence at this moment. Henceforth, you'll always be able to quote at least one line. It's in the last paragraph where you will recall when I remind you, it says, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. In the Pennsylvania State House that's now called Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the best men from each of the colonies sat down together. This was a very fortunate hour in our nation's history, one of those rare occasions in the lives of men when we had greatness to spare. These were men of means, well-educated, 24 were lawyers and jurists, nine were farmers, owners of large plantations. On June 11, a committee sat down to draw up a Declaration of Independence. We were going to tell the British fatherland, no more rule by redcoats. Below the dam of ruthless foreign rule, the stream of freedom was running shallow and muddy. And we were going to light a fuse to dynamite that dam. This pact, as Burke later put it, was a partnership between the living and the dead and the yet unborn. There was no bigotry. There was no demagoguery in this group. All had shared hardship. Jefferson finished a draft of the document in 17 days. Congress adopted it in July, and so much is familiar history. But now, King George III had denounced all rebels in America as traitors. Punishment for treason was hanging. The names now so familiar to you from the several signatures on that Declaration of Independence, the names were kept secret for six months for each new the full meaning of that magnificent last paragraph in which his signature pledged his life, his fortune, and his sacred honor. Fifty-six men placed their names beneath that pledge. Fifty-six men knew when they signed that they were risking everything. They knew if they won this fight, the best they could expect would be years of hardship in a struggling nation. And if they lost, they'd face a hangman's rope. But they signed the pledge. And here is the documented fate of that gallant 56. Carter Braxton of Virginia, wealthy planter, trader, saw his ships swept from the seas. To pay his debt, he lost his home and all of his properties and died in rags. Thomas Lynch, Jr., who signed that pledge, was a third generation rice grower, aristocrat, large plantation owner. After he signed, his health failed, his wife and he set out for France to regain his failing health. Their ship never got to France, was never heard from again. Thomas McKean of Delaware was so harassed by the enemy that he was forced to move his family five times in five months. He served in Congress without pay, his family in poverty and in hiding. Vandals looted the properties of Ellery and Clymer and Hall and Gwinnett and Walton and Hayward and Rutledge and Middleton. Thomas Nelson, Jr. of Virginia, raised two million dollars on his own signature to provision our allies, the French fleet. After the war, he personally paid back the loans, wiped out his entire estate, and he was never reimbursed by his government. In the final battle for Yorktown, he, Nelson, urged General Washington to fire on his, Nelson's own home, which was occupied by Cornwallis. It was destroyed. Thomas Nelson, Jr. had pledged his life, his fortune, and his sacred honor. The Hessians seized the home of Francis Hopkinson of New Jersey. Francis Lewis had his home and everything destroyed, his wife imprisoned. She died within a few months. Richard Stockton, who signed that declaration, was captured, mistreated, his health broken to the extent that he died at 51, his estate was pillaged. Thomas Hayward, Jr. was captured when Charleston fell. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside while she was dying. Their 13 children fled in all directions for their lives. His fields and grist mill were laid waste. For more than a year, he lived in forests and caves and returned home after the war to find his wife dead, his children gone, his properties gone. And he died a few weeks later of exhaustion and a broken heart. Lewis Morris saw his land destroyed, his family scattered. Philip Livingston died within a few months from the hardships of the war. 
John Hancock, history remembers best due to a quirk of fate rather than anything he stood for, that great sweeping signature attesting to his vanity, towers over the others, one of the wealthiest men in New England. And yet he stood outside Boston one terrible night of the war, and he said, burn Boston, though it makes John Hancock a beggar if the public good requires it. So he, too, lived up to the pledge. Of the 56, few were long to survive. Five were captured by the British and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes from Rhode Island to Charleston sacked, looted, occupied by the enemy, or burned. Two lost their sons in the army. One had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 died in the war from its hardships or from its more merciful bullets. I don't know what impression you had had of the men who met that summer in Philadelphia. But I think it's important that we remember this about them. They were not poor men. They were not wild-eyed pirates. These were men of means. They were rich men, most of them, and had enjoyed much ease and luxury in their personal living. Not hungry men, certainly not terrorists, not irresponsible malcontents, not fanatical incendiaries. These men were prosperous men, wealthy landowners. They were substantially secure in their prosperity. They had everything to lose. But they considered liberty, and this is as much as I shall say of it. They had learned that liberty is so much more important than security that they pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And they fulfilled their pledge. They paid the price. And freedom was born. We hold these truths to be so evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness.